getting Elevate to where we are today and with the speakers that are here. Commander Chris Hadfield. ACAR. Mr. Bill Morneau. Join us in uniting the world's innovators to solve society's greatest challenges. Bad times usually create great companies. You can either uh, help this issue around income inequality or you can bulletproof your Tesla. Welcome, everyone, to episode five of Elevate Live. My name is Razor Suleiman, and I am your host of the show today. We have an incredible guest of honor today on our show, Scott Galloway, and we're going to talk about crisis management. You know, we thought that was absolutely the right topic, um, given that Scott has experienced so many past crises and has navigated through them, and what we are all dealing today with COVID. You know, it affects every human and every company, every country. It, it has no uh, boundaries and it will continue to impact humanity. And so when I reflect back on uh, our own journey through this and my own, even as an entrepreneur, you know, we've had some difficult times during, you know, 9-11, the tech boom and bust, the Great Recession. But COVID is unlike anything else we've ever seen. Uh, you know, not only do we have this health crisis, this global pandemic, but we also have this eminent economic recession, which I'm going to say is going to turn into a depression, probably, you know, potentially as great as the one in the 1930s. And so it's so important to have thought leaders like Scott Galloway. He's great with his predictions. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to hearing his guidance uh, as we navigate uh, at Elevate uh, through these unprecedented times. Let me give you a little bit of context to why this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, after selling uh, my last company, Achievers, in 2015, uh, you know, my wife Karen and I decided to take on a few passion projects. Uh, she called me Fun Employed uh, when we started Elevate uh, in 2017 with Toronto Mayor Tory and a number of leaders in the ecosystem. And the goal was really to showcase what Toronto and Canada was doing on the global stage. Uh, 2017, we uh, produced the festival in about 90 days. 4,000 people showed up, which was amazing. We've hosted a couple since then. You know, in 2019, uh, our, our, our guests were over 20,000. Elevate had hosted uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama. We've hosted uh, Google former CEO Eric Schmidt, Martha Stewart, Akon, um, Wyclef, a number of global leaders, artists, sort of descended on the Elevate main stage, and then COVID happened. You know, we were doing one thing, which was really to create the South by Southwest of our generation. Uh, the organization had been going up like a rocket ship, and COVID changed everything. It made what we did uh, not safe. In fact, it made it illegal. Large gatherings are not prohibited uh, most places around the world. And so, it really forced us to look inward. It forced us to really look at uh, why we do what we do. What is the purpose of our organization, which is to unite the world's innovators to solve society's greatest challenges. And we really looked at that purpose. And yes, a festival is one way in which that can manifest, but there are so many other opportunities. And so, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And so the team and I quickly pivoted to providing the best of Elevate as a digital experience. We wanted to provide the best of the main stage or our master classes and make it free to our community because it's really why we do what we do. And so I know each of our you know, thousands of guests uh, uh, on our live audience today are also navigating some really difficult times at their organizations and maybe in their households and you know i would just say look to your, your purpose and why you do what you do look to your people your partners and really be authentic because it's not easy for anyone we will get through this and we want to just make sure that when we've got access to such great global thought leaders like scott galloway who have 
generously donated their time to be here on the Elevate main stage and share his insight with you. That's how we want to be able to service our community. So we've got an amazing show today. As I mentioned, Scott Galloway is a triple threat. He is a best-selling author. He is uh, producing his own podcast, and he is uh, uh, one of the highly, highest rated professors at Stern NYU. So we're excited to learn a little bit more about him. And what I love about Scott is that he is unfiltered. And so we're going to hear some really great ideas, some crazy thoughts. Uh, and he is a self-proclaimed expert on crisis management and particularly on why you must overreact. So we're going to hear thought, Scott's thoughts around why overreacting as a leader is absolutely the right strategy to navigate these unprecedented times. We want to make sure that this is engaging and inter interactive for you as possible. Please join us online. We are on all social channels, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter and using the hashtag Elevate Lives. So share your comments, your feedback, your questions. And if you have a question for Scott, we're gonna do a live Q&A. Scott will answer any question that you have. So go to your Zoom tab and click on uh, the Q&A tab and post your questions. We'll be doing questions in the back half of today's show. So really excited for that uh, part. And uh, before we get into today's show, just want to let you know how excited we are. We have Mark Cuban joining us next week. Dallas, Dallas Mavericks owner, Shark Tank star, billionaire business icon is going to be joining us next Wednesday, May 13th, right here on Elevate Live, noon Eastern, every single week. Uh, so we're excited to chat with Mark and get his thoughts so let's talk about Scott Galloway, and, is this, and he's a triple threat, as I mentioned. He's the author of the best-selling author, Four, we, where he analyzes the dominance of the four horsemen, really the big tech companies that are dominating society. He is also the co-host with Kara Swisher. We had her here last week on Elevate Live, and Scott and Kara took their uh, uh, global award-winning podcast, Pivot, uh, on the show, their first international experience was at Elevate this past September. They come out and done a, a show to a standing room audience only. It was such a huge success. Uh, Scott shared his passion for our hometown Toronto Maple Leafs, always uh, a way to play up to the audience. And Scott is now hosting his own newly launched show. It's a weekly business show on um, Vice TV called No Mercy, No Malice. And so what I love most about Scott is his ability to predict the future. Scott predicted Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods long before anybody was talking about it. Scott also predicted the downfall of WeWork and the challenges that they're now facing. And most importantly, he predicted the rise of Elevate and our ascend to becoming the go-to global gathering place for tech leaders, founders, CEOs, celebrities, global icons gathering at Elevate every year. We will gather again uh, and more on that later. So welcome to the show, Scott Galloway. Uh, thanks very much, Razor. It's good to be with you. Uh, it's good to have you on the show, Scott. Where in the world are you joining us from today? So we're sheltering in place here in Delray Beach, Florida. It's just a it's a small kind of the closest thing Florida has to a surf town just south of Palm Beach. Got it. Last we had heard from you, you were rubbing massage oil on a beach in Mexico with Troy Aikman. Uh, how did that experience go? Uh, really well, although Troy and I went to UCLA together um, and uh, he has not changed. I look like a different species. So the first thing I thought when I saw that guy was, how does he look like he does after 30 years and I look like me? But other than that, it was uh, it was nice, but it's nice to be it's nice to be home. Great. Well, we're glad that you made the time. You know, we had your co-host, Kara Swisher, last week on the show and she crushed it. Uh, she scored yeah. an 82% rating from our live audience, and we are going to rate you at the end of this show. It's where the teacher oh, becomes a student to know you're going to be graded. So we want to see your best because we know how competitive you are. That's right. 83, 83 or bust. 
83 or above. Before we get into our official conversation today, Scott, how are you doing personally and professionally? How has COVID, COVID affected you, your family? Just wanted to check in. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, I would say that we are uh, blessed and recognize our blessings. We're in a, we live in a nice home. We live in a nice place. Everybody is healthy. Uh, we aren't worried uh, economically about uh, paying our mortgage. So on the whole, we're doing really well. Uh, we have a, my youngest son, nine, is struggling with this, the lack of structure um, uh, because of no school, the lack of socialization has really taken a toll on him. And whenever one year you kind of have your world of work, you have your world of friends and you have your family. And when something comes off the tracks with one of your kids, the whole world just sort of collapsed to what is uh, that child. So that has been stressful and upsetting. Um, uh, uh, so that's, I think a lot of us are struggling who have kids with, uh, how do we adapt to a new normal without structure with our children? And, uh, so that, that just, just to be blunt, that has been a struggle. Um, uh, but other than that, you know, our blessings vastly overwhelm, uh, any setbacks we've had. So on the whole, we, uh, we feel very grateful and we're, we're doing well. And, and thank you for asking. Uh, listen, uh, COVID has been difficult on everybody, but I do feel for our younger generation, you know, the teenage years are difficult enough. And now to, you know, not to be with their friends, to have to be socially isolated with their parents, you know, to miss graduation, prom, those life milestones, I think it's going to be really challenging on their mental health. So glad that they have you. Scott, what's giving you joy these days? Where are you finding um, happiness? Mostly an original scripted television and edibles. Um, uh, I've watched The Tiger King, this wonderful show called Unorthodox. I've been uh, uh, exercising a decent amount. I've been trying to produce a great deal of content. I think this is, um, so I love this notion of functional speed. And my, my father will tell you that the Leafs have the fastest front line, the fastest skaters in hockey. And there's this notion of uh, functional speed and the greatest w wide receiver in the history of NFL was a guy named Jerry Rice. And he wasn't the fastest guy, but he had incredible functional speed. And that is he had an incredible instinct for when to accelerate and decelerate such that he could get open uh, more than other receivers. And I think that this notion of functional speed uh, and variance applies now. And that is that there are people professionally, most of us are kind of running at 60 to 80% speed all of the time. And because of the novel coronavirus, some of us are at 0%. Literally, our job, our professional career has been arrested. There's nothing we can do from home or very little. Our organization hasn't prepared us for this. And then there's people who are working at 80, 90%. I think that the opportunity, and if you look at uh, the opportunities to lap the competition, it's when there's extreme variance. So we have extreme variance of productivity professionally right now. So I think this is, represents an extraordinary opportunity to really bear down and turn on the jets. And if you're fortunate enough to be in a position where you're healthy and your family and the people close to you are taken care of, to work exceptionally hard and try and lap the competition. So um, I have been pretty much working around the clock and uh, I'm not a workaholic. I'm outstanding at not working, but mm -hmm. I'd like to think I have functional speed and I've decided to accelerate and take the opportunity. I'm writing more, I'm doing more television, I'm doing more media. I'm doing more online classes. I am working 14 to 16 hours a day such that I can continue to be outstanding and not working a lot the rest of my life because this is an opportunity. COVID-19 represents an opportunity that if you have the resources to produce or continue to do what you do professionally, this is the time to accelerate and show functional speed because I'm launching a TV show tomorrow night. There's no new TV shows after the next eight weeks. Typically, there's something like 14 to 17 new sh shows every week. Through COVID, there's two to three, so there's more opportunity to stand out. And we've gone through the incredible stress and pain in the ass logistics of trying to produce a TV show with masks and distancing. But I think that's the opportunity. So what I would say is there's an enormous opportunity presented to us if we have the opportunity to turn on the jets and, and demonstrate functional speed right now. Yeah, I love that notion. Let's talk through uh, some of the past crises that you've lived through. Um, you know, the 87 crash, 9-11, the tech boom and bust, um, 
the Great Recession. How is this different? How are you, what are you advising your students, uh, your audience around how COVID is different than maybe the past crises that you've endured? Well, look, the terrible thing about crises is they always happen. The wonderful thing about them is they always end. So uh, even I, I admittedly, I'm a glass half empty kind of guy, but this will end. And, and we ha always have to kind of keep that in mind, uh, spe specifically if you're fortunate enough to not have anyone in your life who's impacted on, uh, in terms of their health. My first crisis was uh, 22 years old, right out of UCLA, 1987. The, the stock market crashed. They asked us at 1251 Avenue of the Americas to come down to 17th floor because they said what was going on was historic. It meant nothing to me because I didn't have any money. I didn't know what the stock market was. I didn't care. The next major crisis uh, for me was really the, um, the AIDS epidemic. I was living in San Francisco. Uh, my, a lot of my close friends uh, were severely impacted by the virus. You were in the midst of a plague and you would, I lived near the Castro and you'd walk through the Castro and you would see, it felt like one in three of these healthy or formerly healthy young men were gonna be dead soon, that they were walking, they were the walking dead. Uh, I lost my freshman roommate from uh, my fraternity at UCLA to HIV. And that sad, what was really tragic was that he died alone because he felt so ashamed of it uh, because we didn't really come to grips with what that meant as a society in the 90s. We're exceptionally um, uh, bigoted and, and, and harsh on, on, on people who contracted the virus in, in the 90s. Uh, so that affected uh, me. Uh, and, and I think I'd like to think gave me some perspective about empathy and how fortunate uh, we are. I mean, I, I look back on this, uh, being born in the mid sixties as a white heterosexual male, you, it was kind of, you won the lottery. I came of age when you had free education in California, vis-a-vis -vis the generosity and vision of California taxpayers and the regents of UC. I got an amazing education at UCLA and Berkeley for free, flung me into these opportunities around the internet processing power, more wealth created within a seven mile radius of San Francisco International Airport from 92 to 99, and had been created in all of Europe since World War II. I recognize mm -hmm. some of those economic uh, tailwinds. So I was literally the luckiest man in the world. And I think it's important that people of my generation don't conflate luck with talent. I'm a talented person, I'm, I'm, I'm not modest, but I also realized that I was born at exactly the right time and with exactly the right demographic. And yet my freshman roommate was born at exactly the wrong time uh, because of something out of his control, just as the way I was born was not in my control, he couldn't have been more unlucky. And that is being born a white male homosexual. If he had been born 10 years earlier, it's likely he would have led a different lifestyle. If he'd been born 10 years later, the warm hand of science um, would have saved him. So I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And the guy next to me and my uh, freshman roommate was the unluckiest guy in the world. So I try to, I try to, I took from that crisis just how um, incredibly fortunate I am. And then this crisis, look, I, I, the other crisis for me were economic. The dot com bubble was humility for me. In 1999, I was looking at jets. I thought I was a genius. By 2001, I was no longer a genius and no longer looking at jets. In 2008, I got run over by the recession. The timing for me was there was especially poor because my oldest son had the poor judgment to come rotating out of my girlfriend. And I found myself in my 40s with, you know, economically strained and having a child, which really played on my sense of masculinity and trying to be a good provider. That was very upsetting. But I, you, the, key to res, the key to success is resilience and perseverance and realizing you're not as smart as you were in 99, but you're not as stupid as everyone was saying you were in 2008 and one foot in front of the other and recovered well. I would say this crisis is more uh, frightening uh, from the sense that uh, typically coming out of most crises like a war or an economic crisis, there's a shared vision of victory and a path forward. And the victor um uh, has a unified vision they get to pick the vision and we move on and coming out of an economic crisis you suffer through it and you come back typically pandemics have a more scarring effect on societies because uh, whereas the guy next to us is our our friend and our ally it's like that great movie gladiator when 
Russell Crowe says, whatever comes out of these gates, if we fight together, we survive. In a pandemic, the guy or the gal next to you is the enemy. And I believe, unfortunately, distinct to the Hallmark commercials and the manufactured wonderful moments uh, that we are fond of here in America, I think that America, uh, and I don't think this is as true of Canada, but I think America has proven itself to be incredibly incompetent, incredibly arrogant. And that despite having more time to prepare for this virus, despite having spending more money on healthcare than any nation in the world, despite thinking we're the most innovative country in the world, with 6% of the world's population, we have a third of the deaths. And I think it's gonna be scarring for us. And I think I'm hoping I'm hoping that we reduce that scarring by reducing the apex of the relapse and by finding a vaccination or therapies. Uh, and maybe I, I'm hoping make a change in the administration here, who I think has demonstrated just a striking lack of competence and empathy. But I'm not, I'm not hopeful. I think this is going to be a difficult recovery. I think it's gonna weigh on the nation psychologically. And I, like you, am not hopeful economically. I can't. I can't figure out, I feel like the markets have entered into consensual hallucination with Trump and CNBC. And right now they're back to where they were, the NASDAQ and the Dow or where they were in March of 19. So if you didn't know what was going on and you were just looking at the markets, you would say, okay, they've come down, but you wouldn't know where we are. I, own, I only own big tech stocks. My only criteria for owning stocks are I like monopolies that are unregulated, so I own big tech. And I just looked at my portfolio, just those four stocks, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google are up about six or 8% for the year. And I don't see how that can continue. So um, I'm, not, I'm not here with a message of hope. I, I do think we got through this. We've gotten through much worse. Uh, our grandparents were called to war. Our parents were called to Vietnam. We've been called to the couch. So if we demonstrate a fraction of the metal previous generations have have mustard will be fine. But in terms of the markets and the economy, I like you are actually quite quite bearish. Yeah, you, uh, you stated that you are the guy that overreacts in times of crisis. When you think about that as a strategy, what leaders, what companies do you think are really embodying your you know, overreact in a time of crisis today? So I, I just want to be clear because I got this wrong. Um, initially, when I was planning to go to South by Southwest, I think I fell into the American arrogance of thinking that somehow we're different and the virus isn't going to impact how our awesomeness as Americans. I wasn't worried about it. Um, so I fell into the same sort of American exceptionalism, which is really translated into incompetence. Um, so I don't want to pretend that I saw this before anybody else did. In terms of crisis management, uh, what I teach my kids when I say my kids, my students, there are really only three things you have to remember, but they're difficult to do. The first is you have to have the top guy or gal be seen as addressing the issue. And so let's look at the president. He's done a decent job. He's having press, uh, at least in format, he's trying to communicate regularly. That's what he should be doing. There's some dispute around how he's handling that. He should probably just put the doctors and the scientists forward. But you know, you give him a B on trying to be present and available in a crisis. And that's what the leader is supposed to do. You're supposed to acknowledge the issue. We've had a tanker run aground, extraordinary ecological damage. This is really bad. Acknowledge the issue. Um, it doesn't feel as if we in the US have ever really acknowledged this issue. Um, it was gonna be a virus that disappeared constantly slow balling death rates, constantly trying to downplay what was going on, uh, never really acknowledging the issue. And then the key, the key attribute in a crisis is to overcorrect. And the reason why Johnson & Johnson is one of the seven most valuable companies in America, the reason why they came out of the Tylenol cyanide crisis, a stronger brand is rather than saying, well, this is an isolated incident in Illinois, don't worry, everything's fine. They cleared the shelves of every bottle of Tylenol at huge economic uh, costs. The, the ability to overreact, whether it's in personal relationships, don't get into an argument with your spouse over why they're upset, acknowledge the issue and then overcorrect and show that you take their concern seriously. Martha Stewart didn't go to jail for insider trading. She went to jail because she refused to acknowledge the issue. Tiger Woods almost lost his career not because he was unfaithful. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and assume that quite a few athletes have been unfaithful to their spouses 
but because he refused to acknowledge the issue. Consumers love to forgive, but what they hate is when people slowball the issue and never acknowledge the issue or don't overcorrect. So we have not overcorrected. This has been the mother of all undercorrections, and I would argue there isn't a CEO. You want to be the governor? You want to be the CEO that's accused of overcorrecting? It's not being being the governor that had too many ventilators is a fraction of the downside of being the governor that's ha that has too few ventilators. So I think this is absolutely an environment to overcorrect, and um, I, I I think that's just a common theme across a crisis like this that you know we're facing an issue now around reopening in the u.s and people are talking about the damage the economy is going to incur if we keep closed and there is there are deaths of despair that are based on economic fragility and i think america has to look at itself in the mirror and say how did we put 50 percent of our population if we're supposed to be the wealthiest country in the world in such an extreme position of vulnerability that they can't be out of work for 30 days or 60 days. That in itself is going to inspire, I think, some real interesting questions. But the, the, the penalty for opening too early is dramatically greater than the penalty for opening too late. So it would strike me that just basic math and algebra would mean we would want to err on the side of caution with a virus that really doesn't care what our plans are for the economy. And it's very strange, our gross idolatry of the dollar in the United States has led to an environment where if the human species were to be wiped out, that would be bad. But what would be worse is if the NASDAQ went down. I feel as if we've lost the script around what is really important. And on a risk adjusted basis, just mathematically how we measure the risks and how that translates to our actions. Got it. You know, you talked a little bit about um, about uh, consumers and whether it be a governor in their messaging. You know, you're one of the foremost experts around brand strategy, and we do get asked a lot, "What's the right way?" If you're a business leader, CEO, founders, we've got thousands of them on our on our uh, show today. What's the right tone to take when you are trying to message to your consumers or your community? Uh, I would stop with the bullshit Hallmark ads. I would start with, first off, whenever a company says we're in this together, it usually means they're paying their people like shit and asking the government for a bailout. I would stop with the we're in this together, that we believe in America. A lot of American corporation CEOs are rugged individualists and believe in capitalists on the way up and then talk about how we're in it together on the way down and want to embrace socialism. And I find these commercials obnoxious. Uh, I think it's more about very open and honest communication with your employees. This is what's happening to our business. This is what it will mean in terms of layoffs or what it won't mean. This is our cash position. Uh, I think you should treat adults as if they're adults. And I think in times of crisis, what we leaders have, successful leaders have said is, whether it was Lincoln, whether it was FDR, uh, would say, these are the death tolls. This is what is going on. This is where we lost battles. This is how much land was lost you know, in the, in the Belgian forest. Uh, I think people want straight, hard analysis. I think they want to see their leaders engaged, and I think they want to be held accountable. I think they want to know what they can do. Um, I interviewed Mark Benioff for my first show for tomorrow night, and I liked what he said. He said, everybody in the company needs to have the will, but also the instructions on what it is you should be doing to help us through this. Uh, so I think people want to participate. Um, you know, one of the failures I think of our government in the U.S. is, you know, one of the things I'm embarrassed about, whether it was Katrina or 9-11, I wanted to do something, I wanted to help, and I ended up doing nothing. And I thought, that's it. This time I'm going to try and be more helpful. So I started thinking through, how can I help? I, I'm sick of crises coming and going, and my good intentions didn't translate to anything tangible. And in the U.S., I think they've done a terrible job of figuring out how people can help other than buy more, you know, buy more of this beer because they run a commercial saluting our frontline workers. Um, I, I think leadership is is addressing the issue. It's sober, honest information, lighting a path out, being totally engaged, totally engaged. I think I think Jeff Bezos, I'm not a fan of Amazon, but I think Jeff Bezos is showing extraordinary leadership. He's totally reengaged. He's overcorrecting. I mean, you want to talk about leadership raiser. He announced in the earnings call, I know you're expecting $4 billion in profits, 
but sit down. He literally said, shareholders should sit down. I'm taking that $4 billion and I'm reinvesting it <laughs> in protective equipment, new protocols, additional compensation, distancing, and I'm going to create, and I think this is just staggering, I'm going to create the Earth's first vaccinated supply chain. And that's one level of leadership. On the other side, you have an Elon Musk that puts out a tweet saying, I think Tesla's stock is overvalued. That creates mayhem in the market the same trading day. His investors take him at his word. They take the value of the stock down 10%. Tesla loses the value of Southwest Airlines and every shareholder litigator litigation firm in America is pulling out their pencils and, and thinking, how can this guy make it so easy for us? And is testing the limits of the SEC, uh, identifying and showing that his board is totally flaccid and useless and totally incompetent fiduciaries and creating distraction and tumult and shareholder insecurity for him, for his employees. I mean, what good comes from that? It's as if it's like when your kid you tell your kid not to beat up your brother so he or she goes and gets a gun just to challenge you. That's not going to do anybody any good. Yeah, so one is one one leader is overcorrecting, making massive investments, adapting to the scenario. I believe that you, as part of your prime membership in 12 months, here's a prediction. I think Prime offers 48-hour delivery. Prime Video, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, storage for your photos. I believe that being a Prime member means in six to 12 months that you will get within 48 hours uh, COVID-19 testing for the virus or antibodies. I think Amazon is gonna be the most robust tester of the virus because the biggest consumer category that has just been invented in the last 60 days is, is testing for COVID-19 antibodies or the virus. And I think Amazon has seen the opportunity is going after it and the vision and the resources to create this vaccinated supply chain is just, it's staggering to me, the vision and, the, and the, 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 the sack he is showing. And then you have another guy who I've, you know, appears to be doing rails of cocaine and then hitting Twitter. I just don't understand what is going on there. And I wanna be clear, I have no evidence that Mr. Musk does drugs or does not do drugs. But this behavior is, it, you, there's one is a case study in leadership, one is a case study in the lack thereof. Yeah, listen, we're big fans of, of Amazon and what they're doing. And he's always been long-term focused. I mean, he's created the most amount of wealth with the least amount of profit. So clearly Jeff Bezos knows what he's doing at the helm. And Mark Benioff, I mean, since he started that company, he's been sort of the iconic social entrepreneur. He just happens to use his big tech company to move society forward uh, based on what he thinks is sort of the right thing or his company thinks is the right thing to do. So we're big fans and we're excited to see Mark on your show. Uh, thanks for giving us that heads up. We are going to go into predictions uh, before we go into our Q&A. We've got a number of questions from our audience coming up, but let's go to predictions. Let's talk a little bit about the digital divide and how you see the world. You know, we already know the world is a little bit divided into the haves and have nots. Let's talk about the haves right now. You talked a little bit about, you know, the big tech companies are up six to 8%. How does big tech fare, you know, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months after COVID? What do they look like? Give me your sense of where they're gonna be in the future. Uh, they consolidate power and they get stronger. The only difference, the only thing standing between us and a key step to tyranny is, which is involves private power overrunning the government where the government no longer becomes a countervailing force to private power, but a co-conspirator. I mean, we're just one or two years away from that. We have the Department of Justice and the FTC who are supposed to break up companies have their budgets cut every year. And meanwhile, Amazon now has over 100 full-time lobbyists in Washington. I mean, I'm really hoping we come out of this with a reshifting of our priorities, recognizing that pandemics have killed more people in our history uh, or in the history of the modern world than wars have. And yet we have a defense budget of 600 billion and we cut the CDC's budget to 6 billion. It feels just in terms of capital allocation, we're kind of all screwed up. In terms of, I think we need to, I think the best investment we could make would be to overfund an FDC and DOJ and break these guys up. I think they've become way too powerful, but let me be clear, I'm a shareholder. As long as they're unregulated, as long as they're monopolies, there's no reason to ever buy another stock. The general consensus among investors who were trying to get you to pay them exorbitant fees to manage your portfolio was, well, big tech is booming on the way up and when we hit a recession, they'll probably be hurt more than other stocks. So I'm gonna figure out 
your portfolio. That was total bullshit. Big tech is up. I mean, think about this. We're in the midst of a global pandemic and Apple, Amazon, and Facebook, and Google as a basket are up since January 1. Um, Facebook and Google will take the shortest, the most vicious short-term bump, but it'll be like a V. They'll go from 60 cents on the dollar to 70 cents on the dollar. They'll rip back up. A lot of brands will just totally abandon TV, radio, and print. Um, you're gonna see Apple have a slower downturn. Uh, that stock has been recast because of its move into recurring revenue because the iPhone has started growing again. So it's gone from a P of 12 to 24 without really increasing its earnings. So I think that stock goes sideways. The company that is absolutely, that is going to bust a move and become the first $2 trillion company is Amazon uh, on the backs of this vaccinated uh, supply chain, but most likely healthcare. And that is the most disruptable business in the world right now is US healthcare. It's 17% of our GDP. It's probably the largest consumer business in the world. It's been raising prices much faster than inflation, which creates all sorts of opportunities for disruption. Only one in six people are happy with their healthcare. And what COVID-19 has done is it's created the spark that might catalyze this disruption or rethinking healthcare. Because if you think about what's happened here, somewhere between 95 and 99% of the people who have contracted, endured, and then exited COVID-19, hopefully healthy, um, never entered a doctor's office or a hospital. So we're gonna have what I would call the great dispersion that will dramatically impact the two most disruptable industries in the world right now, and that's healthcare and education, because we're gonna recognize that we can deliver 20, 40, 60% of healthcare uh, digitally through telehealth. So that's gonna create incredible opportunities. Now, what company is best suited to, to reap that extraordinary transition in stakeholder value? Some people would say it's Apple. I think Apple's value in healthcare is overrated, distinct of the charming stories of someone in their Zumba class collapsing and 911 being, being called. Amazon has your body mass index through the items you purchase, they have your credit card history, they have smart cameras where you could hold up your kid's rash to your Amazon show. They have an uh, online pharmacy. Once you get the steroid uh, prescription, could immediately be fulfilled by PillPack, which sends it to your house. They could start altering your diet through AI based on your health conditions. And most importantly, they have the key asset to go into healthcare, and that is they have access to the cheapest capital in history. So one day you're going to come home and Alexa is going to say, Hey, Razor, would you like to cut your health insurance costs in half? We're in Canada, you don't have any health insurance costs. Hey, yeah. hey Razor, would you like <laughs> pediatric care at a lower cost or whatever it might be? And it'll say, say, Alexa, tell me more about Amazon Prime insurance or Amazon Prime uh, health care. And in the US, within two to three years, they're going to be the fastest growing healthcare company in the world. And the stock is going to become, the stock is going to go parabolic and it's gonna to get to $2 trillion in value. The other thing that's gonna take them to 2 trillion in aggregate value, and this is another prediction, is the most valuable company in the world in 2025 will be a company that doesn't exist right now. Razor, quick, quick question, let's do the class. What am I talking about? A company that doesn't exist right now will be the most valuable, or it doesn't exist in its current form, will be the most valuable company in the world in 2025. Any guesses? Something related to COVID, the co company that comes into the vaccine. That's a great so, one. And that's that's a fantastic yeah. answer. And you might be right. I would argue the most valuable company in the world in 2025 is going to be AWS. That will have been spun oh. from the parent Amazon uh, prophylactically to stave off, uh, to stave off um, antitrust. I think AWS, there is no pure play way to play the cloud right now. If you want to play it, you have to crawl over a software company to get to Azure. You have to crawl over a search company to get to Google search. You have to crawl over an e-commerce company. The fastest growing, largest cloud company will be a stock that everybody has to own, and it'll be AWS. And uh, uh, I think Bezos will come to an agreement with regulators that'll spin AWS. And Amazon shareholders such as myself will benefit because this company will be worth more in pieces than it is as an aggregate right now. Uh, but anyway, some predictions there. I think Amazon uh, becomes the fastest growing healthcare company in the world, spins AWS. Facebook and Google have V-like recoveries. 
the economy in the U.S. is either an L, hopefully, what the, I think most likely it's a chair, and that is we test new lows in the next 90 to 180 days. Uh, but big tech is now 24% of the S&P. It was 21% at the beginning of the year. Big tech is now, the, the there's five big tech companies that are now worth more if you include Microsoft in the bottom 400 of S&P 500 companies. So we should just start calling it the S&P 5. Uh, but these companies have become way too big, way too powerful. The best thing we could do for the economy, for our tax base, for our democracy, in my opinion, other than electing a new president, would be to go in and break these guys up. Got it. We're going to go to our audience for predictions around the other side. Which industries do you think are going to struggle and not regain back their former glory back in 2019, same question to you, Scott, but if you're at home watching, we're gonna give you 30 seconds while Scott shares his answer around which industries you think are gonna be most negatively impacted and not recover post COVID. Scott, who do you think, whether it's an industry or a company, who do you think doesn't come out of this? Well, there's, for most industries, COVID-19 is more of an accelerant than a change engine, and that is uh, I've been presenting to a bunch of boards saying, what does the future look like? I'm like, well, you know what the future looks like? It's just happening faster. And that is, there's a saying that as we age, we become more like ourselves. And I think that's happening in retail. Department stores were in the bottom of the seventh inning. Now they're in the bottom of the ninth. They're just going to go away. You could see a company like The Gap go away, which was just unthinkable. But if J. Crew can go away and this thing goes longer, absolutely The Gap can go away. And Taylor, Loft. You know, especially retail apparel uh, is going to have a very, very difficult time. Uh, department stores, I must think like any retail with an escalator is probably not going to be around. At the same time, there's going to be some retailers who thrive because once you have a culling of the herd, the remaining elephants have more foliage to feed off of. So a company, LVMH and Sephora and Restoration Hardware and a, a Warby Parker, I think are going to, are going to boom. Um, you're going to see... This unbelievable uh, transition of somewhere between 70 and $100 billion in uh, grocery go from the stores to online. So that'll hurt terrestrial grocers, but it'll create an entire industry around servicing the supply chain, whether it's cold storage lockers or Ocado, which does um, pick and, uh, robotic picking and packing. You're going to see, I mean, Canada probably... If you were to say who are who are the next guys, who are the fifth and sixth horsemen, Canada actually has one of the companies that might be sort of a new kid on the block or is about to get keys to the executive washroom, and that is they have ridiculously cheap capital and an inflated stock price, which might give them the ability to pull the future forward, and that is Shopify. I think Shopify is one of the most interesting companies in the world right now. But uh, retail gets hit really hard. Anything involving live or density gets hit really hard. New York gets really hard because the, the magic of New York, uh, my, you know, where I teach and where I've lived for the last uh, uh, 20 years is its density. That's what makes New York wonderful is that you cram all these incredibly creative, smart, wealthy people or people with a lot of disposable income and you say, all right, if we put you on an island that's two by seven miles, you're just gonna come up with a bunch of crazy, wonderful shit in the form of restaurants, culture, great nightlife, great places to drink, great places to not drink, great places to eat, great places to, to come up with crazy artistic ideas. When density all of a sudden goes from being a feature to a bug, we're gonna dramatically rethink what it means to live in a place like New York. It's just gonna have so many second order effects. So retail gets hit very hard, 24 square feet per uh, capita uh, in the US. London, you know, the UK has three. So US, US retail gets hit exceptionally hard. We're going to see, I mean, it depends where you go across media, we're going to see ad supported media fall under further pressure. The two largest radio companies in America probably go bankrupt for the second time this year. We're going to see if you wanted to look at a survivability index of media, you would just look at the percentage of revenues they get from subscriptions. So the New York Times, for example, survives and is fine because two thirds of the revenue are now subscription. But a Viacom, a BuzzFeed, a Yelp, I mean, these companies that don't have the scale of Facebook or Google that are not subscription probably don't make it out of the ICU. 
And then there's other industries where there's just dramatic opportunity because of this great dispersion. We talked a little bit about healthcare. The other industry, which will be incredibly exciting for new companies, new ideas, because the incumbents have gotten so fat and happy and lazy and competent. And I'm, this is a man in the mirror test, is education. Education is supposed to be a $10 trillion industry by 2030. And just as we've had this great dispersion moving away from hospitals and doctor's offices, we're going to experience this great dispersion away from campuses. I'm supposed to teach 170 kids starting September 1 in the fall at NYU. And I just can't imagine that we are going to decide to put 170 kids elbow to elbow in the middle of Soho on September 1. Uh, we're still in, in, in this sort of denial or delusion stage, thinking that campuses are going to go back to normal in the fall. Uh, the best campuses will figure out a hybrid model. There's going to be five to 700 universities go out of business in the next 24 months because people just aren't going to pay for a media, a, 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 a mediocre cost accounting professor. If you wrap football games and fall leaves and the, the university lawn around that person, he is tolerable. On Zoom, that person is absolutely awful and intolerable at $68,000 a year. So you're going to see... I mean, my industry is about to get the shit kicking it has deserved for 30 years. We have preyed on the hopes and dreams of middle class Americans uh, that believe that their kids have to get into school, that it's the key to a better future as it was for me in the 80s. And we've starched out all the surplus good. We charge way too much. It's a cartel where we have duopolies across every city. Uh, NYU, Columbia, New York, Stanford, Cal, the best universities. We turn away 80 to 90 percent of our applicants who then go to second tier universities who charge the exact same amount. So it's the only industry where people are paying the same price for a Toyota and a Volkswagen that they're paying for a Lexus and a Ferrari. And we're about to see that pricing model absolutely collapse. And we're about to see the Guild and one of the most corrupt unions in the history of America called Tenure. We have social welfare for the undereducated in the form of food stamps and unemployment. And we have welfare for the overeducated in the form of tenure. That is probably going to have to go away. And we're going to see several hundred universities just, just not open again because my industry is, is just, is just become so overvalued and is not delivered across as in no way kept pace with the price increases in terms of the underlying value. We have stuck our chin out and the mother of all fists of stone, COVID-19, is going to meet that chin in the fall of this year. Okay, so lots of a little bit of a break. That was a lot of people. Let's go to our audience and see where what they thought. We've got our poll results back. Uh, looks like many of them do agree with you. Retail is going to get pretty, hit pretty hard. I got some of the numbers. Uh, hospitality, you know that that main street that we all love is uh, really struggling right now. And so, you know, they're predicting 30 to 50% of restaurants may not come back online post COVID. So definitely small businesses, we're seeing that impact. So let's try to figure out a way how we can sort of support our own communities and uh, retailers, because they're such an important fabric of our society and our community. Scott, we are gonna go over to our live Q and A uh, for the first time ever on Elevate Live. We're gonna have our first Zoom bomber in Debbie Gamble. Uh, Debbie Gamble is the chief innovation officer at Interact. Interact was, uh, you know, created in the in the 80s in Canada. It's debit across the country. It is sort of Venmo on steroids for several generations. Um, Debbie is actually a secret fan girl of yours. She uh, skipped her family vacation in Mexico to hear you and Kara live at Elevate. Sorry, Debbie, if I blew your cover, if you told your family you were doing something else, but she stuck around. Thanks, Razor. So, Debbie, over to you for the first question. Thanks so much, Razor. Indeed, I am a fangirl and so excited to chat with you, Scott. Um, you've said that the crisis is offering opportunity for people to move beyond the fear zone of the pandemic and strengthen and repair relationships. And like many people, I've spent a good amount of time over the last couple of months reaching out to friends and family around the world um, uh, to have my own personal algebra of happiness moment to try and rekindle those bonds. So my question for you is, can this lesson translate into corporate culture? 
And how can corporations use this opportunity to build upon the positive elements of, of the current situation to authentically um, build and strengthen our relationships with our customers, our partners, uh, even our employees to move beyond that fear zone and perhaps, as you said earlier, to lap the competition. Uh, where are you from, Debbie? Is that, do I hear a Scottish twang or are you Welsh? Where is that? That's very close. I'm originally from the UK, but I have family on the west coast of Scotland. So good catch. Yeah, I hear that. I, I'm uh, last name Galloway. My father, Sandy Hills, Glasgow. It took me, it immediately started hearing it like, it's not quite Scotland, but yeah, I knew it was somewhere in there. Anyways, thank you for the generous question. So look, I, I think leaders uh, will take the opportunity. You over communicate in times of crisis. You're in a services business, reaching out, saying, all right, look, this is triage. How can we be helpful to you? Being very transparent. This is how you can be helpful to us. Yeah, it's an opportunity to strengthen relationships. I think we tend to think um, uh, as our relationship with a company, as an animate relationship. And my viewpoint is you have relationships with people, not companies. Companies are legal entities that are never really going to be concerned with the condition of your soul or take care of you when you get older. They're incredible platforms. But I've always said, be loyal to people, not, not to companies. You bring up, so I wrote a, uh, Debbie's referring to, I wrote a book called Algebra of Happiness. And the inspiration and the catalyst for it was two years ago, I was talking to my sister, I call her every Sunday night, and she said, Scott, why are you so pissed off all the time? You have less reason to be pissed off than anyone I know. And uh, you're pissed off all the time. And I recognize my blessings are this and my mood is this. And I went about going, uh, trying to fix that. And I did a ton of research. And what I found is that happiness is a skill and it requires a set of behavior modifications and a different way of thinking to become good at happiness. And there is kind of one best practice across every study. And I think I've read almost all of them around happiness. And that is at the end of your life, looking back on your satisfaction or lack thereof around the decisions you make, they all kind of reverse engineer to one thing. And that is the number and depth of relationships you have. At work, do you feel respected and admired and do you respect and admire other people? Amongst your friends, do you get a sense of joy and camaraderie? And just as importantly, do you know they feel a sense of joy and camaraderie from you? And finally, and most importantly at home, do you feel an intense level of love and support? And again, just as importantly, do you know uh, that they know that they are intensely loved and supported by you? And as it relates to COVID-19, it goes back to this notion of variance. Uh, in the armed services, we give out medals to people based on how they behave in times of crisis or specifically their grace under fire, their, their willingness to put themselves in harm's way uh, in, the, in the agency, in the service of others. That is who we give medals to. Your life or your character in your life, your, the perception of you is a sum of all your actions and it's kind of written in pencil. But what's traced over that in indelible ink is how you behaved in times of crisis. We're in a time of crisis right now. And I think this presents an extraordinary opportunity. And that is if you are fortunate enough to be healthy, if you are fortunate enough to be in a position where you are okay and you can get off your heels and on your toes, I think it's important and an opportunity to ask some very basic questions, and such as, do you have the relationship with your parents that you'd like? If you were unable for whatever reason, if you or one of your siblings were admitted to a hospital and as these horrific stories are playing out that we hear that some people are passing away, without ever even getting to see their family. Do you have the relationship you want with your siblings right now? Do you have friendships that have withered on the vine or for some reason aren't as strong because of some bullshit perceived slight or competitiveness? This is an opportunity to show incredible grace under fire. This is an opportunity to demonstrate generosity. This is an opportunity to demonstrate uh, appreciation. This is an opportunity, an unparalleled opportunity to accomplish in years, right? Or to accomplish in weeks, what might take years normally. And that is the repair and the cementing of the only thing that matters at the end in terms of your happiness. And that is the depth and meaning of your relationship. So just as this is an opportunity 
to take advantage of the variance and lap the competition professionally. This is an enormous opportunity to repair and restore relationships. You can, re you can accomplish in weeks here by reaching out to people, by expressing generosity, by clearing the slate, putting the bullshit aside, uh, expressing your love, expressing your generosity, and make the kind of progress in weeks that can take years in terms of relationships. So, you know, my advice is this is an enormous opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. You know, to, if you think of yourself as a generous and loving person, well, act on it because those expressions are more meaningful under fire in times of crisis. And that's the time we're in right now. Great, thank well, you. Sir. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie. Thank you for joining us today. We're now gonna My go pleasure. to Tom Hall. Tom Hall was the most upvoted question on our Zoom uh, conference, uh, on our Zoom uh, show today. Uh, he just wants to get your thoughts around, is it smart to go to a top MBA school? You know, what's your advice around, um, you know, sort of passing or lapping the competition during this time? Uh, so I'm getting a lot of questions about business school. So I'd want to know some specific questions from Tom. But if you don't get into a top business school at these prices, you probably shouldn't go. And what happens is, People want to go to a top school. Sometimes they don't get in and they talk themselves into going and they come out with huge student debt. Um, so only go to a top school. And when I say top school, I mean brand. And it's not fair, but we have a caste society in the U.S., uh, not as much in Canada, whereas it's not our family name. It's where you go to college. Brands mean a lot. These are the most powerful brands in the world. No one gives $100 million to Apple to put their name on the side of a building on the Apple campus. So Brands like Stanford, Wharton, you know, McGill, these are the strongest brands in the world. Uh, so if you get into a grade school, it's very tempting. Now, in terms of timing, I would argue that this is a fantastic time to take a gap year because my industry has not figured out how to teach people at a reasonable level of competence and effectiveness via Zoom yet. We will figure it out. There will be some sort of hybrid model based on how safe it is and the level of distancing we need to achieve. But I would argue there's an enormous opportunity to take some time to do something else. If you're into a great school and you have the money, um, it's also probably a really great opportunity to get into a great school right now because, quite frankly, a lot of people, a lot of great business schools are going to clear the waiting list because a lot of kids aren't going to show up in the fall because they're going to realize they don't want to pay $68,000 for a bunch of shitty Zoom classes. Having said that, the primary benefit, the primary benefit of a world-class MBA is not the education. It's not what I'm going to teach you. It's not even the connections you're going to make. It's the certification. There are a large class of companies globally that will pay you 40 to 80% more than you made 24 months before because NYU or Stanford or Northwestern has certified you. So purely economically speaking, it might be a good to great time to go back to business school if you're in a position to get into a great school. Personally, and from a life experience standpoint, I would probably take a gap year or do something else next year because without the campus experience, without the in-person experience, it is just gonna be a series of wildly overpriced Zoom classes. So I think we need a year to get our act together. If you wanna email me at scott at stern.nyu.edu, I can ask you some more specific questions because it's a bit situational around where you got in, your financial situation, your current job. And I'll be happy to discuss this with you. I do a lot of this. But things are different than they were three or six months ago around the, the calculus around uh, going back to school. Uh, listen, I think that's uh, uh, great advice uh, as you should think about the ROI, particularly in that next academic year. Scott, we did say we were going to evaluate you and make the, uh, the teacher oh, be the no. student. I'm going to go now to the audience. I'm a, just remember, I'm a delicate little flower, and I have one I request. Know. There's no mercy, no mercy here on Elevate. Love me, don't judge me. Love me, don't judge me. Oh, we're all judging. Okay, so we're new to the audience. Scott, you talked about how you're doubling down, creating more content, doing more media. I'd love for our audience. Can you see Scott Galloway doing his own Elevate show? Okay, so it's a quick, easy yes, no, how well you thought he did today. We're gonna share the results in a moment, uh, but I do want to thank you. Either way, Scott, you got my vote. We would love to have you back. We'd love to give you your own Elevate show. You clearly uh, are uh, lots of words of wisdom. As a little thank you, 
of our appreciation here at Elevate, we have planted you a Scott Galloway Forest in your name with our partners at Trees Canada. Once we solve the COVID crisis, know that you are doing your part for the climate because we really do got to remember that we are also dealing with a climate crisis. So Scott, know that you're going to have a beautiful Scott Galloway Forest in the Great Lakes region uh, in your honor. Thanks so much. That's generous. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. While we're just getting the last few votes, I want to remind everyone next week, we've got Mark Cuban on the show. So excited next Wednesday to be chatting with Mark Cuban right here at Elevate uh, Live noon Eastern time to register. Go to elevate.ca slash live. And uh, Scott, we know that you've been tweeting a lot to Mark lately. You want to do a little Zoom bombing next week and, and ask him a question live on the show? 100% no. <laughs> okay, we'll take that as a maybe. Great. Okay, let's go to our poll results. How did Scott Galloway do on today's show? 99% get out of here. I want to recount. 99, Scott, that's literally the highest score that we've ever got on Elevate. So you've been doing something right. I should just leave now. Uh, okay, that is all the time that we have today, Scott. Thank you so much for your time, your words of wisdom. We will be setting a follow up uh, around the key lessons from Scott to our audience today. Special thank you to our executive producer, Lisa Zarzechny, for creating today's show. Uh, let's continue the conversation online at Elevate Live using that hashtag. And again, take one minute, fill out our survey. We read every comment. Feedback is a gift. We'd love for you to tell us who you'd love to hear from, what topics you'd like us to cover, and what we can do to make this a better experience for all of us. Thank you so much for tuning in to Elevate Live. Stay healthy, stay safe, and let's take care of each other. Thanks so much. My name is Razor, and I'm signing out for today.